Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Recovery and Resilience in the Grasslands. My name is Kelty Manalakis. I'm the Manager of Engagement in the Alberta Region for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to start by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectfully acknowledge that the work we do across this country is on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities past and present. For millennia, they've worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Today's webinar is brought to you through a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy of Canada, the Calgary Zoo, and Alberta Environment and Parks. For a number of years, these organizations and others have worked together using their different areas of expertise to create long-term conservation solutions for the recovery of greater sage grouse in Canada. The Nature Conservancy of Canada, or NCC as we're known, is a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization, working to protect our most important natural areas and species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped to protect 14 million hectares or 35 million acres coast to coast to coast. To learn more, visit our website at natureconservancy.ca. The Calgary Zoo is a conservation leader whose mission is to take and inspire action to sustain wildlife and wild places. As a not-for-profit charitable institution, a portion of all revenue is reinvested back into conservation activities at the zoo and around the world. The Ministry of Alberta Environment and Parks supports environmental conservation and protection, sustainable economic prosperity, quality of life and outdoor recreation opportunities. Today we'll be joined by Joel Nicholson, Senior Wildlife Biologist, Alberta Environment and Parks, Dr. Axel Morenschlager, Director of Conservation and Science at the Calgary Zoo, and Lita Pazderic, Natural Area Manager for the Prairie Grasslands Area of Alberta for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today to talk about the incredible work and collaboration that goes into re reintroducing this endangered and iconic species back to its native habitat. Before we begin the webinar, I'd just like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We'll be sharing a link to the recording after the event, so keep an eye on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues, friends and family. We want you to join in the conversation and share your thoughts with our online community. So feel free to connect with us through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag NCC Nature Talks during and after the webinar. We also invite your comments and questions. So you'll notice a Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there and don't forget to include who the question is intended for and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Joel Nicholson. Joel is a senior wildlife biologist for Alberta Environment and Parks. He was born and raised in the Prairie region of Alberta. Life in rural Alberta cultivated his interest in wildlife, which led him to complete a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the Augustana campus, campus at the University of Alberta. His work as a professional wildlife biologist includes management, conservation and recovery programs for prairie species ranging from elk to greater sage grouse. Joel is the current provincial staff lead for sage grouse and oversees the implementation of the recovery program for this critically endangered species. The floor is yours, Joel. Go ahead. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today to find out a little bit more about Alberta's Greater Sage Grouse Recovery Program. Whoops, am I? Okay, start over again here. Sage grouse are the largest grouse species in North America. They're a sagebrush obligate, and that's a plant called silver sagebrush in Alberta. What that means is they're wholly dependent on that plant for their life cycle. In fact, it's 100% of their diet in the winter. Sagebrush is actually full of toxins and sage ghosts are specially adapted to deal with those toxins. And in fact, they can eat that all winter long and gain weight to prepare for their mating season in the spring. In the spring, sage ghosts gather onto dancing grounds or leks and the males fight each other for territory on the leks. The females come through to pick which male to breed with. Then they go off and nest alone and they hatch out the chicks in... Uh, May and into June, we're actually just getting some broods hatching in Alberta um, 
these days. And so we're, we're busy monitoring uh, some of our birds here. So historically, sage grouse occupied a very large area in Alberta, 49,000 square kilometers. Currently, they've contracted only about 10% of that range and they're concentrated in the southeast corner of the province. They're very sensitive to human disturbance. Uh, everything that creates structure on the prairie um, has noise. Um, they've got West Nile virus, uh, increasing numbers of predators bothering them and killing them. Um, obviously cropland conversion completely changes their habitat. They're unable to adapt to that. And then of course we've had energy development um, in some of the areas which causes a, a bunch of those uh, issues for them. You'll notice the image that I have on the screen here is actually the um, southeast corner of the province. So Montana is the area that's cultivated up to the Canadian border. So they're only present in the southeast corner of Alberta because there are some very large chunks of intact native grassland sagebrush habitat left. Now, of course, sage grouse are famous for their elaborate courtship displays. And so this is a remote camera we had set up on a LEC site in Alberta. And you can see those big air sacs that they inflate and they bounce around. They make this loud popping sound. They've got their tail all fanned out and spiky. They're just a, a spectacular bird. And so they will attend these leks every morning for, uh, you know, at least a couple of months in the spring, trying to attract the females. And they, they put out a tremendous effort to um, try to pass their genes along. And so this is one of the things that they're, famous for, they're extremely large, you know, like a, a large male will be the size of a Canada goose. So um, very famous for that. If you look at our population in Alberta, back, we've got data uh, from back to the mid to late 60s and we had thousands of sage grouse in Alberta at that time. They really um, started to decline in the late 80s and, uh, and into to the 90s. And we almost lost sage grouse in Alberta um, back in about the 2011-2012 time period. We were um, doing some pretty significant interventions, which I'll talk about more. But sage grouse right now in Alberta, we're probably estimated we're around 75 birds. So they're still critically endangered. And uh, we're trying to uh, make sure that they stay on the landscape in collaboration with uh, a bunch of our partners. We created a sage grouse recovery plan for Alberta. The latest version has four main points. We want to improve habitat through restoration, reclamation, acquisition, decrease predation on sage grouse, promote population recovery through translocations from other jurisdictions that have healthy populations, and then also look at methods for captive rearing and release. And you're going to hear about um, aspects of, uh, of all of those today. I'm going to focus on our recent translocation program. And so we were, we've actually been moving birds up from Montana and we're certainly grateful to the state of Montana and their wildlife agency for assisting us with this efforts and allowing us to take some of their birds and bring them up to Alberta. We've completed um, four translocation efforts now or sorry, completed three and we have four that we would like to complete. So we're, we're shooting for 2021 for our final translocation. Essentially, we go out at night using a spotlight. We find the sage grouse hens roosting up in the sagebrush. Uh, we travel around on quads. We put a spotlight on them, put a net over top of them, and then we end up uh, putting GPS uh, units, satellite GPS units on the birds to monitor them. Our idea is that we're going to keep our population on the landscape and buy time while we focus on habitat restoration. So once we've got the bird in hand, it gets a vet veterinarian uh, check over. We do some uh, sampling for disease testing and other things. Uh, then we affix a transmitter onto it. And these transmitters actually go around the legs. They're called a rump mount and they actually sit on the bottom third of the sage grouse's back. You can see the little solar panel on top there. And they essentially log GPS data, send it up to the satellite, and then that data comes back to us. So once we've got that, uh, got the bird all transmitted, it gets put in a box, put in the back of a truck, gets driven up to Alberta, and then we 
put a special release box uh, close to a lek where there are still a few displaying males in Alberta. And then we open up the doors and hopefully these hens fly out and see a handsome Canadian sage grouse and land on the lek and um, are uh, happy with their new home. Sometimes that happens, often it doesn't. But we release them back into um, the habitat where hopefully they can uh, survive and persist in Alberta. And so that was one of the releases that we did on the last translocation. So once those transmitters kick in, um, I get an email every morning at 7 a.m. and I get uh, the data sent to me automatically. It gets processed through some software and it generates a file that pops up in Google Earth. And so we can actually see exactly where our bird has been the last number of days while we're sitting in our office drinking a coffee. Um, sometimes that's great when the weather's nasty, but other times we'd kind of like to be out in the field doing it ourselves. But this technology is quite amazing and it allows us to monitor the birds in ways that we never could before with traditional telemetry. And so if you look at this particular bird, um, it actually was released in Alberta and you can see on the left side of the screen that grid there, that is actually Alberta, Saskatchewan to the east, Montana to the south. And to orient you, you can see that big uh, green blob um, is uh, the Bear Paw Mountains and the lake there is Fort Peck Reservoir in Montana. So this bird actually did not like the experience of being brought to Alberta and it headed uh, east into Saskatchewan, south into Montana, went about 60 or 70 miles. You can see between May 13th and June 10th, it went almost 600 kilometers. So we do see this response in birds sometimes. Um, where they're stressed out, they get taken to an unfamiliar area and they take off. Now, sometimes they actually come right back to where we release them after, and so that's fine. But um, when they do this, they typically do not nest. So if you look at this bird, um, she actually was released in Alberta, and you can see the grid there as well, which is the very southeast corner of Alberta. And she ended up um, doing a very large movement and actually going north heading between Medicine Hat and Lethbridge into areas where sage grouse haven't been present for probably 60 or 70 years. And you can see that she's using bits of native prairie, which is the lighter colored stuff, the dark red being farmland. And she's sort of uh, hopscotching between bits of native prairie, but she came all the way back into the release area um, where we sent her and she went a total of 387 kilometers during that time period. So you can see that they are able to navigate back there. The thing is when they do those very risky movements, they um, sometimes don't survive because they're in very poor habitat and other times um, they just don't nest that year. So this is what we like to see as a bird settling down into the area. And you can see um, in this time period, this bird only went a total of two kilometers. And so essentially it's spending its time on a nest and just going out to have an incubation break and feed uh, once a day. And so when we see this behavior, we then can document that the bird's on a nest and we can follow up with the monitoring of that bird um, and determine when it's off its nest and then go determine the nest fate. And so we actually um, had a graduate student, Kayla Balderson. Kayla did a great job for us. And in fact, I believe she works for the Nature Conservancy now. And she, hopefully she's listening today. Um, and so Kayla looked at the movement rates of our birds and she found that um, the non-nesting birds took around 10 weeks to settle down. You can see that movement rate with that top line. Whereas the birds that nested, uh, they only took uh, three or four weeks and they would settle down and get on the nest and stick in the area. And so the birds that we really want to see are these nesting birds and, and that subsequent generation that's been raised in the area will hopefully bolster our population. One of the things that we find is something eats our sage grouse. They're not real high on the food chain. A lot of things like to eat grouse. Um, what we have seen is largely uh, great horned owls being our most common predator. We do have mammalian predators that eat them. Occasionally they'll collide with things. We've had West Nile outbreaks. From a nesting standpoint, um, 
We've had uh, corvids take the nest, so that's crows, ravens, magpies. We have mammals that eat the nest, but that's difficult to assess without uh, videoing the nests. But uh, we certainly do have things that uh, like to depredate their nests. So if you look at our um, mortality causes, you can see far and away great horned owls have been our biggest cause of mortality. We did have a snowy owl uh, take one. We've had some confirmed coyote kills and then of course some are, are unknown. Um, so one of the things that we're working on in concert with translocation is just habitat restoration by removal of anthropogenic structures. Um, these provide subsidies to predators like ravens and owls and things like that. Uh, there's avoidance dis uh, exhibited by sage grouse where they do not like to be around these areas. They feel that um, the habitat is risky and so if we can take these structures off the landscape we can hopefully increase the amount of functional habitat. And so we've been busy um, removing different sites in key sage grouse areas um, and this is an ongoing program that we're undertaking. Um, I'm going to leave it there and pass it off to um, Axel next and take questions at the end of the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Joel. We appreciate you providing your insights on Alberta Environment and Parks' role in the Sage Grouse Recovery Program. Our next speaker today is Dr. Axel Morgenschlager. Dr. Morgenschlager is the Director of Conservation and Science for the Calgary Zoo. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Calgary, adjunct associate professor at Clemson University in the United States, Erskine Fellow at New Zealand's University of Canterbury, and research associate at Oxford University where he received his PhD. The team Axel Spearheads at the Calgary Zoo also specializes in community conservation to yield simultaneous benefits for biodiversity conservation and human livelihood in areas such as West Africa, East Africa, and Madagascar. Whenever you're ready, Axel, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Um, indeed, thank you all for tuning in for this uh, exciting opportunity to talk about a species that we all treasure, the greater sage grouse. It's a part of our natural heritage. It's something that we're working so hard to save and indeed uh, are working so, at uh, doing so as a great team. I'm talking to you about science-based action for greater sage grouse, especially as it pertains to conservation breeding for release. And so as we get into this, um, I'd like to share with you, uh, just trying to advance here, sorry, just a slight lag. Uh, just, just doing, ah, oh, there we are. So as we, uh, as we think about wildlife and wild places, one of the things that we concern ourselves with a lot in terms of Calgary Zoo making a difference is that we want to show that we make a difference for wildlife in the wild, whether that be in Canada or further abroad on a variety of species all over the world. And this is indeed for us to achieve our vision, which is to be Canada's leader in wildlife conservation. What we mean by that is being the primary organization headquartered in Canada that makes a difference for conservation in Canada and around the world through our global global efforts. Uh, we take an inspired action to sustain wildlife and wild places and our focus is twofold. We just try to be good at two things uh, but we try to be very good at it uh, indeed to be a world leading authority in conservation translocations for instance which is releasing species in the wilderness to prevent extinction either from conservation breeding or by moving individuals from one place in the wild to another. And the second, community conservation to help local communities to benefit from and to protect wild species, especially through our efforts in Africa, where we work to alleviate poverty in a way that also helps wildlife and wild ecosystems. So we've uh, been working on these efforts for a long period of time. We work on some of Canada's most endangered species, uh, such as the Vancouver Island Marmot, um, the Swift Fox, the Hooping Crane, Northern leopard frogs, uh, black tailed prairie dogs, and the list goes on and on to 10 others. So uh, basically, uh, we have established some credibility in this space. And when I say we, I'm talking about a broader team. And this is our conservation and science team, which works in close concert, of course, with, with uh, other staff, such as our animal care teams uh, at the Calgary Zoo, but also work with partners around the world. And I'm very proud of this group because they have degrees from 26 different universities, uh, experience in 10 provinces and territories, and collective experience actually in, for, in 45 countries doing this kind of wildlife work. So we're very 
privilege to have them. And because of the credibility that we had built on other initiatives um, and the successes we'd had, in 2013, I was approached by a colleague from the Alberta government uh, to consider whether conservation breeding for greater sage grouse could be helpful. And, um, and we actually took this question very seriously because it, the problems are difficult. And, and a postdoc and I spent six months actually looking at it. And, and more or less our conclusion was, maybe it can be helpful. And, and what we meant by that is if the other things are addressed, the habitats protected, the threats are mitigated and such, then potentially we, it can be. And the reason for the uncertainty was that nobody had done it before for uh, reintroductions. Um, we actually convened a workshop at, uh, at the Calgary Zoo where we brought all the brightest minds together from the United States and from, from Canada. Uh, including academics, government officials, non-government organizations, and so on. And after four days among many different conclusions, there was a consensus that the population at the time had a greater than 90% likelihood of extinction within 10 years, and that action was necessary. Happily, I was able to present uh, our findings to both federal and provincial ministers who then actually uh, committed to supporting the program over a 10-year 10, 10 time span. And, and here on the left is our CEO, Clément Lantier, who was essential to that effort as well. As we look at uh, images now of uh, greater sage girls in our conservation breeding facility, um, another thing is that, that other supporters were really crucial, specifically one, John Snyder, who actually um, grew up in Saskatchewan uh, and remembers sort of the depression area times but also remembers greater sage grouse being abundant and is, is disappointed that they're doing badly and committed to making a difference. And I'm always touched by the fact that she named this facility, which is now established after her parents. So here you see a site that many thought would be impossible, actually having sage grouse bred in captivity. And the reason for that is because they're so socially complex because they are a lacking species, as Joel pointed out. And so we've tried to emulate the uh, prairie conditions as much as possible while designing a facility that's also so sensitive to their animal welfare with these very soft nets and enclosures so that they can't possibly uh, hurt themselves or, or in, injure themselves in any way. Um, we're really proud of the collaboration within Calgary Zoo with, with the animal care teams and the, and the conservation science teams, as well as the uh, amazing amount of advice and collaboration that we've had from from our partners in Canada and further abroad. Um, here you see actually the result of uh, sage grouse being loaded up. There's uh, Don McKinnon. He's the leader of our our program on the on the Calgary Zoo site. A very accomplished wildlife biologist, and he has a smile on his face because he again is doing something people thought might be impossible, which is taking sage grouse uh, from uh, conservation breeding to load them up for eventual release into the wild. One of the things about this is that it actually provides a sustainable uh, population um, that we can draw on now that it's established uh, to, to be able to sustainably source individuals year after year because of course the breeding individuals are there to supply more and more. And what we see now is we actually see birds in the wild or actually in pre-release enclosures. So we actually set up enclosures in Alberta and in uh, on Grasslands National Park lands in Saskatchewan, where for a week to two weeks, we actually take care of the birds on the, on the ground there. And the reason that we do that is because we want them to acclimate to the site in a way that they don't then disperse as far because they're sort of more used to the conditions. And, and here you see these juveniles and you'll even notice many of them wearing little transmitters around their neck. They're younger than some of the uh, pictures shown previously by Joel. And so that has some challenges. But one of the things that is tremendous here from the first release on the NCC site in Alberta is that we actually have birds which have never seen the wild before bred in, in, uh, in a conservation breeding setup that return really strongly and go out into the wild. Um, our teams actually work on these populations year round. So we have scientists that are tracking them uh, on foot using radio telemetry by airplane um, uh, and using GPS and even drones to download GPS signals. So the complexity and the hard work cannot be underestimated or understated. 
all of these kinds of efforts are only possible through partnerships, whether that's for our work uh, globally, whether that's for our work on other endangered species, but specifically for this kind of situation. Saving greater sage grouse is not easy and it takes uh, commitment, it takes courage, and it takes the right kinds of partnerships. So for us, we're incredibly proud and feel privileged to work with the Alberta government, uh, with uh, Parks Canada in terms of Grasslands National Park, and with NCC so that together we can try to achieve uh, gains that will present a legacy. All of this is only possible for our agencies, of course, through the support of others and those that want to make a difference. So we thank all of you who indeed have stepped up and who show interest and who will help to share the story further. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Axel. We're so grateful for the time that you've shared with us today and for sharing your expertise about conservation breeding for sage grouse and other species at risk. Our final speaker today is our very own Lita Pesderic. Lita is the natural area manager for the prairie grasslands for NCC in the Alberta region. Lita grew up in Claresholm, Alberta and then moved to Lethbridge to pursue her post-secondary education. She received her diploma in renewable resource management as well as a certificate in fish and wildlife technology from Lethbridge College. From there, she transferred to the University of Lethbridge, where she obtained her degree in environmental science. She spent nearly seven years with the Old Man Watershed Council as their program coordinator before joining the Nature Conservancy of Canada team in 2015 as the natural area manager for prairie grasslands. Lita feels privileged to get to partner with stewards of the land, working on initiatives to protect, protect grassland species through the conservation of their habitat. And just as a heads up, Lita not only works in the prairie grassland, she also lives there. So don't worry if there's a slight glitch in her video feed. It's just a real authentic rural Alberta internet experience for everyone. Take it away, Lita. Thanks so much, Kelty. Um, yeah, I, yeah that's, thanks for the heads up and, and I hope people don't get uh, too worried if there's a slight delay. I'm going to actually turn my camera off to hopefully boost transmission. So let me just do that. Um, okay, so Yes, thanks so much for having me out today um, to tell you a little bit about what we got going down on down in southern Alberta here. Um, so I'm going to just start off with my first slide here. And uh, the, this is an image showing the northern Great Plains outlined in green and uh, so like the prairie provinces up there. And on the left hand side you can see all that area in green. Um, is intact, you know, unimpacted landscape. And so this is pre-settlement. So early 1900, you can see that there isn't a lot of impact in the in that area. If you jump to the map on the right, we're looking at present time and uh, you can see a lot of that green area is no longer there. And so the red shaded area is human altered landscape. Um, we've done a lot over the last hundred years. And um, I guess this is why right now the grasslands are considered the most endangered, one of the most endangered ecosystems on the planet. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it has a major impact on the species and wildlife that depend on, on that area to live. This uh, slide here with um, all, it shows a whole bunch of the species that um, I've actually taken pictures of over the years uh, working in the grasslands and unfortunately all of these species are at risk or endangered and or on the sensitive list and it's it's you know just a, a sad reality and one of the species that has been hit the hardest is our is our greater sage grouse um, like Joel and Axel both reference they need large open spaces of grassland to thrive to to mate and to nest and then to overwinter in and so um, I know I know Joel had mentioned that their range has really decreased over the years and in Canada we're left with just 10% left of of their you know their habitat and so the image here the figure shows the dotted line um, shows what their original habitat was and now it's been reduced down to that gray shaded area and I think it's really important to note that, you know, with all these recovery efforts, so even if um, the translocation 
project is super successful and the captive breeding program is super successful, uh, it means nothing if we don't have any habitat left to release these birds on. And, and so that is, that's kind of where NCC comes in um, because we, we know it's critical for, for habitat for all these species to, to thrive in. And so what NCC's role is, we either, we work with private landowners to place conservation easements on private land and, you know, which would eliminate further de development on that land or cultivation and, you know, really protects it for, for the future. And another way we work is we actually secure our own properties and steward them. And so when we're, when we're doing that, we use data and research to help guide, our, guide us in that um, endeavor. And so this map is an image that shows Southern Alberta here. And the purple layer that you're seeing is actually spring pronghorn habitat. And then uh, the yellow layer there is critical sage grouse habitat. So when, when a property comes, you know, a landowner comes to us or we're looking at a parcel, we'll use this information to really prioritize if it's our best use of our resources and should we be investing in it, are we going to get the best bang for our buck and, and really protect what we're, what we're after. And so that's pretty much just what happened in, in 2018. You know, the, the Calgary Zoo came to the Nature Conservancy saying, well, we really need a, a site to release our, our greater sage grouse from this captive breeding program and we need it to be on private land. And so we've, we've uh, got this, you know, and then it just happened that uh, Joel happened to know of a perfect property. So all things came together nicely and we, um, we purchased this, this quarter section of land. It's just under a quarter section, 150 acres. And it's down in the very southeast corner of the province. And um, it's, I, it's an ideal location. It was marginal cropland, so very unproductive, uh, which is important to know because it hadn't been farmed for years. And it's not like we were taking a really productive crop out of, um, you know, out of service. We were actually, it's the ideal project to restore back to native. Um, it's surrounded by crown land that's beautiful sage grouse or sagebrush um, and, and very close to some existing lex. So we couldn't have found a better spot. Um, and so year one, so we purchased the property and right off the bat, we're, we're working with Joel Nicholson uh, to, to go through the, the Alberta Sage Growth Recovery Program and look at what we need to do to make sure that this site is gonna be ideal for the sage growth. So uh, like Joel mentioned, uh, they're, they are really, you know, susceptible to predators such as corvids and great horned owls and that sort of critters. And, and on the property, we had some abandoned railway cars. So we, they, um, we set up some trail cameras, or Joel and his team did, just to see what was going on in, in these buildings. And you can see from these pictures, we got a lot going on. So there's a coyote in the one corner, and then you can see uh, there's a weasel here. I think it's a short tail weasel. You can see him hanging from the rafters, um, doing acrobats, and then uh, we got a little cottontail down here, and then this is, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's a badger going through. And so all of these critters, aside from the cottontail, you know, would pose a threat and are a predator to sage growth. So we did decide to remove the, the railway um, cars just uh, to minimize that threat. Uh, one of the other stewardship actions we did right away was we took down an unfriendly barbed wire fence and we replaced it with a temporary uh, portable electric fencing unit called a razor grazer. We can just string that up whenever we need it and then take it down when it's not needed and, and store it. And this really helps other species such as pronghorn who are migrating through this area and have difficulty getting through those, those barbed wire fences. Um, and then in year two, so 2019, we worked with Landwise Solutions and Kestrel Research to develop some preliminary restoration plans. And then we've been consulting with the Alberta Conservation Association. Um, they've had really good success on a restoration project nearby called the Silver Sage property. So we want to know all their little secrets and how we can, you know, do that on our on our site to have good success. 
Um, first thing we did though, with, we hired a, a local landowner to, to farm the parcel and he put a bunch of fertilizer on there and we're trying, we're really trying hard to prepare the soil. Like I said, it was very unproductive and so it takes a lot to prep that soil. So we planted it with um, triticale and then we harvested in September and um, I don't think he got a very good yield, but we're working on it. Um, hopefully this year we'll have a better a better yield. Uh, we decided to plant barley this spring um, because we were told that it's a little bit more tolerant to the saline soils out there. And again, we will harvest in September. And then um, the plan is to go out and gather silver sagebrush seeds so that we can going forward in 2021, we will be, um, we're gonna go out and we're gonna seed the a native mix of grasses and then we'll go, follow along and hand, hand plant those silver sage brush, brush seeds just to um, make sure that we get a little bit more coverage. And um, of course, we're gonna perform many rain dances so that we get all the moisture that we need to have success because um, that's real, really key. So that's pretty much the what we've been up to and what we have planned for the future as far as the restoration on this property. Um, I want to say that we had, a, I have to just tell this good news story, that on the property last year we actually had our consultant who was looking at the soils. Um, he looks over and he sees this hen with like a fresh batch of little chicks um, right just offside the property. So he told Joel and their team went out and sure enough it was one of the translocated hens from Montana and so it had a it had a tracker on it and they were able to to find the nest and so you can see down in the corner here um, those are the eggshells from the from the nest there and this is the the farm our parcel is in the background there so it's right on the perimeter so you know we're in the right spot we're doing the right thing I think because the birds are there so that was pretty exciting and um, and this whole project's been exciting. Like I can't tell you how thrilling it was to actually be at the release and see those birds fly off into into the wilderness and into their you know home range and and see them back on the prairie. So it's been such a thrill. And I I have to say you know this is such a cool project. It really shows how partnerships you know come together and are needed. We have. We have um, everyone really plays their own role, and you know Alberta Environment and Parks, the Calgary Zoo. We had uh, great support from Environment Canada and Climate Change Canada um, to help with funding some of the stewardship efforts on this property. And, and not only that, but we have a lot of private donors that give all the time and to projects like this. I have to give a, a huge shout out to the late Barbara Bell and her family who've made a major gift pledge to support this project and other ones like it in the prairies and we honestly we couldn't do it without our donors and supporters and partners so from the bottom of our hearts thank you so much for supporting our efforts and um, we I'm looking forward to seeing how this project unfolds in the future thank you Thank you so much, Lita, for sharing your insights about the critical need for habitat for the recovery of sage grouse in the grasslands. We really appreciate your time today. Um, so we have several questions that have been submitted by the audience. And just as a reminder, if you have a question that you haven't yet submitted, so please enter it using the Q&A chat box feature. It should be on the right hand side of your screen there. Uh, let us know who the question is for if you can and we'll just get through as many questions as time allows. So uh, I'll just start with our first question and our first question is from Hazel Wheeler. She asks, are Montana birds considered to be part of the same genetic population as those birds in Alberta? Uh, Joel, do you want to take that one? You bet. Thanks for the question, Hazel. <clears throat> um, when we were um, assessing the feasibility of translocation, we looked at the genetics of the birds and how they um, basically are related across the entire range. And so what we found is there's a bit of genetic differentiation north of the Milk River. However, in Montana, 
uh, the populations are not strong enough north of the Milk River for that to be a donor population for the translocation. So we actually went to the next closest related population, which was south of the Milk River. And so we are taking birds from the most closely related population that has uh, uh, enough numbers to actually be a donor population for our translocation. Great, thanks so much, Joel. Um, so there's another question from Anonymous who asks, what are the local perceptions of species at risk in the grasslands and how have those perceptions impacted sage grouse uh, recovery efforts, whether positively or negatively? Uh, I'm sure you all deal with uh, landowners at some particular stage, but maybe Lita, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I think, well, I know there has been, I mean, Joel can probably better answer this anyways. Um, he's been in the grasslands a little longer than I've been working here, but uh, there you, you run into all sorts of, of attitudes and perceptions uh, from different landowners. And, you know, I, I do think it's improving uh, in the past little while. Now that we're not seeing, I know as far as I can speak to NCC's viewpoint in that we used to be there's this notion that oh you're a biologist or a, a tree hugger versus the um the ranchers or landowners on the ground and and now there's more of a collective unit where we're actually all trying to work together because we need we need each other we need uh ranching and and some sort of livestock on the on the grassland to keep that that range intact and with that comes biodiversity and habitat for our species at risk. And so there is, because there's different programs out there like the multi-star program where landowners are working with biologists to get an idea of the species at risk on their properties and how they can really manage their ranch better to accommodate um, those species. And in turn, it will um, benefit the, the livestock uh, that they that they run and their operation that they run. So I personally, I mean, yeah, you always get the odd fella that's like, rah, 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 you know, species at risk and whatever. You're trying to control our what we do because we've got a burrowing owl on our property, but that's just not the case. And and those those occurrences are very few and far between. And it's I find my my experience have been very positive. Um, Lately, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Lita. Does uh, does anybody have anything else they'd like to add to that question, or are we you guys good? I would just say when you're dealing with landowners, sometimes it comes down to personality, just like it does with any other um, group of people you're dealing with, and so um, you have to be uh, um, good at dealing with people to be a biologist. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Joel and Lita. There's another question uh, here from Robin, who is asking, since it was mentioned that human intervention is detrimental to sage grouse, do you think that translocation of this species is potentially doing more harm than good? Um, and she talks about disturbance from quads, et cetera, being handled by humans. Uh, I imagine it's difficult to help with the species thriving whilst intervening as humans. Uh, I was gonna say, so Axel, maybe with your experience in conservation breeding and handling and sort of human intervention. Do you want to do you want to answer that one? Sure, thank you. Yeah, it's an excellent question. I like it very much. Um, it's interesting because this this question pertains to other species in Canada we help with, but but actually around the world too. And one thing that I often say is that the best conservation translocation is one that you never ever need to do. That's what we want. We never want to do them. And yet the need um, and the use of them is growing exponentially around the world. Why is that? Because it because it's useful and because it's being called on more and more because it often works. Not always, but often works. So the uh, so then uh, if we could just not do anything, if we could just keep our hands off this population and do nothing and they would thrive, then we would do that. No doubt. But, but actually that hasn't hasn't been working and they would be extinct. So then it means you need to intervene. And so to the to the question is uh, anytime you intervene, you worry about uh, potentially having an effect. We worry about it a lot, actually. Uh, for instance, in terms of the conservation breeding program, we um, 
uh, were faced with the situation that because nobody had done it before for reintroductions, there actually weren't birds available. So we actually had to source eggs from the wild and we actually captured in a publication, a scientific publication peer reviewed, we looked at what the effects were of that and we found it to be negligible because the same birds actually laid eggs again. But that's how, how much we sort of look at the effects on the population. In terms of the work itself, like getting on the ground and doing things, our team takes great care and, and I mean our teams, you know, across everything that we do, first of all to work in close concert with the local landowners, but also to have a minimal impact on either the species or their habitat. Um, there's nobody I think that's more concerned about that than ourselves, but we, we do it in a, in a way that actually is very effective and that can great, um, you know, yield very positive results. Uh, for the species. Certainly the chances for the species are much higher with us on the ground than if we weren't there. Super, thank you so much Axel. Okay, there's a couple more questions here that we have and uh, I'll start with this one from uh, Anonymous. What are these organizations doing to save necessary habitat as this will enable success for sage growth? Uh, since this is a Habitat question, uh, Lita, I could go to you um, or perhaps in even maybe a follow up with Joel on on with regards to the Alberta government. Sure, yeah, good question. Um, and like I mentioned in in the presentation, na the Nature Conservancy of Canada, that's what we do. We go out and we're we are constantly looking for for private landowners who are wanting to protect their their ranches and their land um, to preserve it for life. So when they put a conservation easement on their land, it's in perpetuity. So this means that that easement and those restrictions, so they can't cultivate, they can't develop or subdivide, um, that's forever. So if they decide to sell their property, the next person in line that buys it still has to abide by those um, restrictions. And so that's just one way that the Nature Conservancy is protecting the grasslands and, and other ecosystems that we have left intact. Um, and then we also, like I mentioned, we purchase our own properties and um, all of the ones in the south are leased out. So we have ranchers grazing either cattle or bison on them. And and this is great. It, it just is um, it's a great partnership and we can be part of the community and that that land is not, you know, shut off from the public. You can you can book it to go hiking. You can book it to go hunting and um, everyone benefits. And and so that's that's what NCC is doing um, every day to to work to protect this important habitat that we have left. Yeah, the other thing I would mention is that corner of the province has some very large chunks of uh, land that's owned by the province of Alberta. So about 80% of what we consider our sage grouse area is actually um, leased out to ranchers for grazing. And so if we have uh, well-managed grazing on those properties, that will meet the needs of sage grouse, like uh, ranching and sage grouse is definitely compatible. We need to be careful where we um, have fences and we need to be careful with our land uses, but um, certainly we do keep an eye on that. The other thing that I'll mention from a habitat standpoint, I, I just had enough time to touch on it today. We've got other programs going. Uh, one is that we're working with the Orphan Well Association in Alberta and there's actually a large amount of, uh, of oil well reclamation occurring in key sage grouse habitat. Now a lot of this development occurred before we knew what the impact to sage grouse would be. Um, it's, it's fairly old, but we're now making some pretty significant progress on removing uh, these old well sites and we're doing so in a strategic fashion to maximize the benefit to sage grouse. And so that's another significant thing that's going on with habitat uh, right now. Great, thank you so much for uh, both of you sharing your insights in that question. So we have time for one more question um, before we wrap things up here today. So uh, I think this, you know, you can each answer this if you'd like. Uh, the question is how can volunteers, and I would even add other supporters, get involved with supporting this project? So um, Lita, why don't we start with you? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great that's the question we always want to hear is how <laughs> how you can help. So there's so many different ways. I mean, right now, uh, COVID has kind of put a little glitch in our volunteer program, but we're <clears throat> very hopeful in the future that we'll get our volunteers out there again. And like I mentioned, um, even just for this specific project, we we will be out there hand collecting uh, silver sagebrush seeds. And so that takes a few people to, to do that. And then as well as planting that seed. So that's just one example of something that you could be a part of on the ground. Uh, we have other projects such as um, replacing, like putting up a wildlife friendly fence or um, putting putting little markers on the fence lines to, to help sage grouse and pronghorn see the fence, fence line. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, I know the rest of everybody, we, we always depend on, on donations. Um, whatever you can give goes a long way. And I have to say, I've never been prouder to work for an organization. Um, the, the, the money really goes where it needs to for conservation. Um, so I'm, I'm so proud of the work that we do. As, as I am of, of our partners. Um, so Axel and, and Joel, you can comment to that. Sure, I'll uh, chime in here. Thanks, yeah, I very much echo that as well. And um, first of all, I just want to point out, of, of course, the Calgary Zoo has a very active uh, volunteer program um, covering all aspects, uh, including as well uh, components to do with our conservation work in. Uh, in the wild. So, so so there's always opportunities along those lines. I, I just want to say in a more holistic way that one of the things that most people aren't aware of is first of all the plight of endangered species, um, but secondly and more importantly is the fact that when science-based action is uh, resourced and taken is it, it truly saves species. And so there is hope in engaging in these kinds of activities. Um, so uh, whether it's a volunteer capacity or any other capacity, just basically being able to get the word out that there's there's a challenge. Uh, there are people that are working very hard to to tackle it. Um, that if it's done well, it it can uh, provide tremendous return, um, and that it's worth getting behind. I think really that's what we want to convey because we're working very hard as as teams and collaboratively. Um, but really it's that broader engagement that will put this over the top and I think that will make a difference in making sure that this precious species is here to 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 stay in, uh, in Canada for you know current and future generations to cherish. So I'll chime in as well and I would say um, certainly there's a there's a few different ways of supporting one of them is certainly with your wallet um, and we've got a lot of partners that work in this area, not just NCC and Calgary Zoo and, and uh, um, Environment and Parks. We've also had partnerships with Pheasants Forever and Alberta Fish and Game Association and Alberta Conservation Association. Even the Wild Elk Federation has put money into projects that actually have benefits for sage grouse. And so um, I encourage people, go to a fundraiser, have a great time and, and go out and support a wildlife cause. Um, take volunteer opportunities when they're presented from these uh, uh, various organizations. And the other thing is, uh, you know, speaking from a government perspective, is, uh, you know, make sure you communicate that you value wildlife. Um, that's one of the things that I think gets taken for granted as wildlife sometimes. And, and uh, you know, whether it be just your own family or your friends or, or your um, uh, politicians or whoever, um, bring that up that you value wildlife, you value wild spaces, you value the recreational opportunities that they provide. And I think that, uh, you know, pushing that awareness and keeping that uh, in front of people um, will make um, those in power make uh, wise decisions for stewardship of our natural resources. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions today, but if we didn't get to your question or you have something else that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, please reach out to us at our email address here, events at natureconservancy.ca, and we'll gladly pass uh, those questions along. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. 
uh, as uh, audience members as well. Joel, Axel and Lita, thank you for sharing your insights and expertise. We're incredibly proud of all the work that's been accomplished so far to recover this exceptional species and it couldn't have happened without all your collaborative efforts. Again, as I mentioned, if you have any additional questions regarding today's webinar or you'd like to connect with NCC, you can reach out to us by emailing our email that you can see there on the screen. If you feel inspired to contribute directly to the conservation efforts of the Calgary Zoo or the Nature Conservancy of Canada, you can either go to calgaryzoo.com or natureconservancy.ca to find out how. As mentioned, there are lots of ways to get involved and to support our work and the work of other conservation organizations. Our next webinar will be Pause with Nature on Thursday, July the 9th at 11.30 a.m. Mountain Time or 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Many people are looking for a natural way to reduce stress and enhance their well-being. In partnership with like-minded community organizations, NCC is working to break down stigmas and barriers that people face when wanting to get outdoors. So join us to hear more on how you can reduce stress and enhance your well-being with a dose of nature. If you're interested in any of our upcoming webinars, please visit the following link for the information and to register. Uh, as mentioned earlier, stay tuned for the link to today's webinar recording, so you'll receive that in our follow-up email within the next 24 hours or so. And again, on behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. We hope to see you again next time.